believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. Then we Someone told me that while I was preaching this morning, said they were kind of looking around to the right and left. And said their wife leaned over and said, what are you looking for? I said, I don't want anybody to rush that boy while he's up there preaching. I said, I'm going to catch him. Before he's up. So nobody, nobody seemed to do that. Uh, you know, after the lunch, uh, or well, really during the lunch, there was a lady. She was visiting our church. Uh, it, was, it was a blessing to me after a sermon like that. She came up to me, she said, Brother Doug, she said, I just want you to know, I, I thank you for that message. And I said, well, that's, thank you. And, and we talked a little bit, you know. And, and she said, I just want you to know that, she said, my family is split right down the middle on the two that are running. She said, you know, some are going to vote for this one, some are going to vote for this one. And she said, there's a, been a, a heated debate. She said, finally, I had just decided that I'm just not, I'm not going to participate in the vote. I don't want to, you know, I just don't want to get into this. And she said, yesterday, it was really bothering me. And she said, I knew the election was coming. It was the first time it was ever set out. She said, I was just praying. She said, here's what I prayed. She said, I prayed, God, would you show me what I need to do in this election? Mm -hmm. And she said, I got up this morning. It's the first time I've ever come to this church. Mm -hmm. She said, God showed me. She said, I decided to vote Tuesday. And you know, I thought, Lord, I don't know if that was for anybody else there. But you answered that one woman. So, you know, hey, that's why, that's why I do what I do. You know, that, that's it. I, I walk away and say, well, I, I've done it like that. I've done the Lord's will. So, uh, it, it's a difficult message. It's a difficult thing to, to do. It's a difficult thing to talk about. You've got all different opinions, right? Opinions are like noses. We all have them. Some are bigger than others. But anyway, uh, <coughs> you know, it, it just it is what it is. It's where we are as a culture. And, and if, if Christians don't stand, speak to us, then the culture is going to overwhelm us. It, it really is. It's going to overcome us. And if we're not careful, we're going to lose our freedom as Christians. Now, I believe that. I believe that if the Christian community doesn't get out and vote, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. And so that's why a sermon like that comes. So, anyway, <clears throat> we're not going to talk about politics tonight. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Moving on. I want to talk to you tonight on from debates to disagreements. From debates to disagreements. And I promise you, I didn't plan this this way. But I thought, you know, after the message this morning, this may be a good discussion tonight. From debates to disagreements. Acts chapter 15 is just sort of where we are uh, in the scripture. It is the time that we talk about the dispute 
uh, in Antioch dispute, and the Jerusalem <coughs> council that comes together to handle this dispute. It's beginning in verse 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 21, all right? And we'll come back, we'll unpack it, and then we'll move on. We'll get through the whole chapter. Tonight, I hope, if we don't, then we'll catch up there next week. It's a good thing about having Sunday night service every Sunday night. Catch that back. Verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom, <clears throat> excuse me, prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. But after Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, uh, the church arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some others to go uh, up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem concerning this controversy. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, explaining in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they <coughs> created a great joy among all the believers. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers from the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. Then the apostles and elders assembled to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in early days God made a choice among you that by the mouth of Gentiles, that by my mouth, excuse me, the Gentiles, would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them by giving the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' neck that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way they are. And the whole assembly fell silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describing all the signs and wonders God had done uh, through them among the Gentiles. After they had stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this as it is written. Now this is a direct quote from Amos and Isaiah. It says, after these things I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. I will rebuild its ruins and set it up again. So the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, who are called by my name, declares the Lord, who does these things known from long ago. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those among the Gentiles who turn to God. But instead, we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses has had uh, those who proclaim him in every city, and every Sabbath day, he is read aloud in the synagogues. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, thank you for the truth that is found here in your word in this chapter. Father, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, just impart this truth on our hearts. But Father, help us to walk out of here understanding how to handle debates and disputes, even in the church. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for being our God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So there is a debate <coughs> there in uh, Antioch, in Jerusalem, about who can be saved and who can't be saved. And it's really not about who can be saved and who can't be saved, but it's about what happens after they are saved. That's the dispute. That's the great debate. Should we make the Gentiles become circumcised? One day when Vice President Calvin Coolidge was presiding over the Senate, one senator angrily told another senator to go straight to hell. The offended senator complained to Coolidge as presiding officer, and Coolidge looked up from the book he had been leafing through while listening to the debate and very wittily replied, I've looked through the rule book, and you don't have to go. The debates. Life is full of debate, too. It's full of struggles. It's full of disagreements. It's full of problems and issues. And you know, the issue that they are they are facing here is not an issue. It's not in God's word. 
Now, I've heard pastors and preachers stand by the pulpits and make statements like, well, you know, if they would have had the Bible the way that we have the Bible today, then they wouldn't have had this dispute. The only problem with that is when James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, we'll talk about him in a minute, but when he stands up to speak, he quotes from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament says that even all the Gentiles who are called by my name in verse 17. And so he stands up and just repeats what God had already said. And so the issue was not God's word. God's word was very clear that the Gentiles can uh, be saved. God's word was very clear. The issue was the hearts of people. Now, I said that the issue was really not whether they could be saved or not. Well, at the heart of it, that's really what the issue was, whether they could be saved or not. Because there were some in the church who <coughs> did not believe that the Gentiles could be saved. They still believed and called them dogs. As Jesus referred to one lady in the New Testament as a dog, because that was the slang term of the day for the Gentile. Listen, you understand, because you know a little bit about the Bible, this is Sunday night group, right? It's not Sunday morning group, this is Sunday night group. <laughs> the learned and the educated of our church. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It, listen, you know a little bit of history there. You know that the Jews did not, they didn't eat dinner with the Gentiles. They had nothing to do with the other. And they believed that the Messiah was sent only for the Jews. Now, now that's not what Jesus said at all. Jesus said he was sent for the Jews first. He did say that, but he did not say he wasn't sent for the Gentiles. He was sent for the world, and the, and the word world in the New Testament, when it says, for God so loved the world, the word world there is cosmos. It means everyone. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Amen? Amen. He loves all. And he wants all to be saved. And so the debate was at the heart of it was, could they be saved? And, and there certainly were some there who would believe that, but the Pharisees stood up, and said it is necessary for them to be circumcised. Now listen, I'm going to be honest. I believe that the Apostle Paul would have rather them said the Gentiles cannot be saved than the Gentiles have to be circumcised. Because Paul himself would say, would write a whole book, the book of Galatians. He would write it to the church at Galatia and he would say, you did run well. What has hindered you from running right? The problem at the church at Galatia was that there were believers, firm believers. In, in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the grace of Jesus that went back and they added the law to grace. And the Apostle Paul would say, and this is a paraphrase, but he would say it's either grace plus nothing or it's nothing and no grace. You, you can't add works to it. You know, if you believe that going to church is somehow going to help you gain acceptance into heaven, then, then uh in, in Arkansas language, you're barking up the wrong tree. It's not going to get you one uh, one more iota entrance into the entrance of heaven. If you think reading your Bible is going to get you into heaven, then again, you have barked up the wrong tree. You're, you're looking in the wrong direction. Now, I know it's a Sunday night crowd. And, and I know you know this. But you also know that my dad was a deacon for 21 years before he got saved. So I just want to remind you that, listen, it's not by works or we boast. Amen. It's about your faith and his grace. Period. And the Pharisees, you know who they are, right? They're the religious rights of the day. They are uh, zealots when it comes to what they believe, and they believe in the letter of the law. And so you understand why it would be hard for them to get away from the law. You understand that. But by the same token, we got to get away from the law. It's not about the law. Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, uh, the apostle Paul writing, he says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. He says, I went up because of a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders, so that I might not be running or have run in vain. And so the apostle Paul says that this confrontation didn't just I mean, he didn't just happen to be there. He went there on purpose. He said it was by divine revelation. He said God spoke to his heart and told him to go. Why? On behalf of the Gentiles, but better than that, on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, there are times where we as leaders, where we as Christians, we do stand in debate. Now, there's not much that I hate any worse than a good debate. 
had a Church of Christ pastor when I was down in Bradley, Arkansas. Uh, he came to me. We were working on the, uh, the backstop at the baseball field. And here's what he said. He said, you know, we need to get together and have a good debate. Out in public, we'll just get together and we'll just debate. Now, I don't know if you know much about Church of Christ. Okay? <laughs> There's a whole lot of difference between the two of us. The majority of Church of Christ believe that you have to be baptized to be saved. And the majority, I didn't say all, but the majority of Church of Christ also believe that once you are saved, you can become lost again. Now, now listen, those two things are huge differences. In the Baptist Church. Now I know that because whenever uh, last year when we showed the movie Woodlawn down at the school, one of the students asked me to give an invitation. I gave the invitation, and there was a Church of Christ man who lives very close to this church who called me and uh, proceeded to really chew me out because I offered an invitation to come to know Christ, and he says, "No way you can come to know Christ without being baptized." The problem in the Christian community is not the lost; it's the Christians. We can't. And so I told him, you know, this guy down in Brad, I said, I don't think this is a good idea. I mean, I'm just going to tell you right up front, I don't like it. And he said, well, we do. Matter of fact, he said, just a few weeks ago, I was at Central Baptist College in Conway having a public debate. I said, well, now listen, that's a whole different ballgame. I mean, at a college uh, setting, I said, you know, maybe that, that works. But I don't think that will work well here. Because I said, I don't think we can debate without one of us becoming angry. And that's the last thing I want to do is try to offend a brother in Christ. And I told him, I said, I do believe that you know Jesus is Lord and Savior. I just believe you've got everything after that wrong. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, I don't believe you can lose your salvation. And I said, let me tell you why. The Bible doesn't say you can lose your salvation. If, the, if God wanted us to know we could lose our salvation, don't you think the most important thing in the Bible, God would have plainly told us, this is what you do. To lose your salvation. And he started quoting verses. And I said, and furthermore, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Because the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he said it. He said, I know John 3, 16. You don't have to quote it to me. <laughs> and boy, he just, and I said, hold it. I'm just trying to prove a point. This is what would happen in a public debate. <laughs> and I said, you'd get angry. And, and, and I told him. I said, I'm going to leave you with this. you get angry because what I believe is true. You can prove that you believe. Mm -hmm. And a few weeks later, he came to me. He said, I'm still looking up scripture. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, I've been gone from that particular church. I was probably there another year after that. And, and then two years as a former, and I, he'd been here for three years, and he's never called again. I guess he's still looking up scripture. I don't know. <laughs> Y'all, the plain truth is, it, it's hard to debate. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite quotes of all time. A.W. Tozer once said that you, you, you debate the truth kind of like you defend a lion who's caged. He said, you can't defend a caged lion. You just open up the door. He'll defend himself. He said, the truth is like that as well. And I believe that. You, you just put the truth out, and the truth will stand. Listen, the Bible says that when the flower fades and the, the, the grass withers, Word of God will stand. When we get to heaven and everything's summed up here on earth and done away with, the new heaven and the new earth, and it's coming, y'all. It's coming. <laughs> Just hold tight. It's coming. When, when that takes place, you know what's going to still stand? The Word of God. Amen. It will stand for all eternity. And all we are to do is turn it loose. But you've got this debate. Now listen, it was an early church and there wasn't a Bible the way you and I have the Word of God. There was an Old Testament. There, there were writings. Everyone didn't have one in their home, and certainly we didn't have the New Testament yet. And, and so you can understand why the debate took place. And thank God that there was a man named Paul, and there was a man named Peter who were willing to stand face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and have this debate. Thank God for men like that. Thank God that they didn't roll over and just say, well, okay, that's what you think, so that's what we'll do, because we want to make everybody happy. We want everybody to be a part of the church here in Jerusalem. And we want you, we want to send kumbaya and, and bless be the tides of fire and hold hands and skip around and, and just have a big time because we just love everybody. That sounds a lot like that cat from Houston, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank God that the church has always had leaders. I'm going to 
tell you, we need more in this culture. We do. We need more Christians in this culture who are willing to stand when everybody else stands. And there are things that we need to debate. There are things that we need to talk about. Uh, right now, the big debate in the Southern Baptist Convention, I don't know if you know this or not, but the big debate in the Southern Baptist Convention is alcohol or no alcohol. It's a huge debate among young pastors. I've heard it a lot. And, 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 and along, right along with that, hand in hand with that, is the debate of Calvinism and, and the liberty that we have as Christians. And, and it's just, it's a debate. It, it's, it, they fight about it. I mean, they really, they argue and they, and they fuss about it. And, and, you know, I just kind of back away. I try my best not to get into those uh, debates because I'm not a good debater. I'm not. I believe in thus saith the, the Lord. I mean, that, that's, that's what I believe. The Bible says to abstain from the appearance of evil. This culture believes that alcohol is evil. Like it or not, that's what it is. I don't care what your taste buds say. You ought to stay away from it. And, and people say, well, you know, the Bible says Paul wrote to Timothy he said, a little wine is good for stomach. said, take some. Yeah, but you ain't Timothy and you have Pepto for your tummy, right? <laughs> Y'all need, you know, you just need to get over that. You need to stay away from things that appear to be evil. Now listen, in that same context, you bring up this idea of, well, what if we just all start smoking cigarettes? <gasps> cigarettes, we can't smoke cigarettes. Cigarettes are bad for your health. Well, what do you think alcohol is? Isn't it funny how we, you know, we just put these different levels on things? Anyway. I hate debates, and I'm not good at them, because I'm not very proud when we, you know, Truth is truth. It just is what it is. The Word of God is written in black and white and red if you have a red letter Bible. It is what it is, right? And, and you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the Apostle Paul's take on things, too. The Apostle Paul, uh, you know, he doesn't mince words. We're going to read what he thought of this debate, y'all. I don't know if you've ever really just sat down and read just that portion out of the book of Galatians, what he really thought about this debate. But he called the spade the spade. I mean, he tells it like it is to the church at Galatia. But Peter stood up, and Peter told them what happened. There was this great debate, the Bible says. The apostles and elders assembled uh, to consider this thing and, and, and just kind of, uh, for note's sake, uh, there are at least four different meetings that take place. We, we've read at least four different meetings uh, in, in this little conference that they have. One is a public meeting uh, where the church uh, welcomed Paul and his party. That's found there in verse 4. And then, then there's this private conference that happens between <coughs> Paul and some of the, the key leaders. And we read about that there in Galatians 2.2. 2. And, and then there is a, a second kind of public meeting uh, where the strong Jewish party, the Pharisees, they, they state their case. We read that uh, just a moment ago. And then there's the council that meets to make the final decision. So the council doesn't meet right off the bat. They don't get together right off the bat. There's, there's argument in the church. And, and when the key leaders of the church hear that there's argument in the church in Antioch and Jerusalem, they get together. They bring in all these leaders together to uh, d decide. We would say it this way. They had a panel discussion at the Southern Baptist Convention to make a recommendation to the convention for a vote on what they would or would not do with this issue. And that's kind of, kind of what they're doing. So they come together and, and the heated debate back and forth. And finally, the Bible says in verse 7, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. He said, now guys, listen, you, you say they have to be circumcised after they're, they're saved. And here's the deal. Don't you remember when this thing was first getting off the ground? And God spoke to me. And we read about it in Acts 10. Where God speaks to him and tells him to go to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius sends people to Peter's house. And it's just this divine uh, intervention takes place from the Holy God. Cornelius is saved. Not just Cornelius, but he and all of his household are saved. And God just kind of breaks loose and, and totally gives Paul, Peter freedom uh, in, in Gentiles being saved. And I just get the picture of, of Paul walking back home from Cornelius' house going, Lord, are you sure? I mean, there's the Gentiles that just got saved. And, and so he had seen the power of God in a Gentile's life under salvation. And so he stands up and he says, don't forget in the early days when this thing was first getting started that I went and did that for some reason. Everybody went, Peter. Now this is not, this is not Doug. This is Peter. This is the 
same Peter who in the last chapter of John was walking on the seashore with Jesus. This is the same Peter who when they were going to the tomb, John outruns him, but Peter is the first to enter in. Same guy. And so when he stands to speak, it carries some weight because he saw Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He was a part of the first 12. And so Peter stands to speak and everything just kind of Everything just gets quiet. The Bible says the whole assembly uh, fell silent in, in verse 12, and they, they listened to Barnabas and Paul. Now, they weren't listening to Barnabas and Paul before that, but when Peter stands, Peter has all of this authority, and when he stands, everything gets quiet. I mean, it, it would be like us having a debate or a dispute in the middle of a business meeting, and, you know, well, I can't think of anybody that would carry that kind of weight in our church, but maybe somebody would. It would be like somebody who's been here for 30, 40 years, uh, even 70 or 80 years, like Ray Moore, standing up to speak. And everybody just in awe. Everybody gets quiet. Why? Because someone they respect has stood for truth. Just like in Ezra's day, when Ezra stood for truth, the many followed. The church follows Joshua's lead. The sad fact is, we're going to talk about discernment in just a moment, but the sad fact is in a lot of churches, we don't have enough spiritual Christians to discern the difference between truth and fiction. And that's what you see happening in the church now. That's the reason we have debates about the various issues that the Bible church claims. So Peter stands to speak, everything gets quiet, and Barnabas and Paul, they, they just begin to describe everything that's happened. All the signs and wonders in verse 12. And the Bible says in verse 13, after they stopped speaking, James responded. Now, it's important to note that James responds last. James is the leader of the church at this moment. Not Peter. The man has already been passed on to James. James was a half-brother of Jesus who was not saved until after the resurrection. And you can understand why. I mean, if you grew up with the guy and then he just all of a sudden starts claiming to be the Messiah, you can understand why if you have a brother or sister, can't you? I have a brother, and he ain't no Messiah, right? I mean, you know, that's just, I think that's kind of how it was. You know, you can't be the Messiah, you're my brother. I mean, it, it doesn't work that way. But then after he saw him die, and he saw him after the third day, arisen and alive, you are the Messiah. Amen. You are who you claim to be. You know why? Because you proved it. You proved it. And so James becomes this key leader it, the baton's already been passed from Peter to James, and he stands to speak. And when he speaks, he speaks with great wisdom, almost like somebody who grew up with Jesus. He quotes from the Old Testament. The very law, the very words that the Pharisees would defend their side with, James spoke the defense for. He says, don't you remember in the Old Testament? Don't you remember Amos and Isaiah, how they said that the Gentiles would believe as well? He said, I think it's good. I think it's good that we let them go. I think it's good that we let them be saved. It's kind of funny to say that out loud. They're not they're going to be saved anyway. Paul was going to go back and preach to them anyway. Barnabas was going to go back and lead out in that movement and see the Gentiles saved. But it's really good when the church finds good discernment and decides to do the right thing and decides to believe and walk in truth. James says, I think we... I think we ought to just let it go. I think we ought to let them be saved and, and not try to put this yoke on them as Peter would say that, that we couldn't carry, neither could our ancestors carry. We couldn't be good enough to get to heaven. That's why Jesus had to come in the first place. Don't forget. And so James says, but we, we, do, need to, we do need to warn them about it. We do need to tell them, you know, there are some things that are in the law that are good things. Like, you know, don't become sexually immoral. Be faithful to your wife. Be faithful to your spouse. And listen, if you don't have a spouse, abstain from being a sexual being in that way until you are married. Because stay away from that because it's important. It talks about uh, from eating anything that has been strangled and from blood. And, and, and stay away from these things that, uh, that have been um, uh, killed because of some type of weird worship. Stay away from those things. 
You know why they said stay away from things like that? One is it's not good for your health. In the Old Testament, a lot of the law that God tells his people is not necessarily a, a righteous or unrighteous thing. It's just simply he knew this would kill them. This is bad for your health. And so he tells them to abstain from some things for health's sake because God knows that it's bad for your health. But another reason is they know that these are things that keep people from being saved. These are things that hinder people from knowing the gospel and believing the gospel. And so he says, you know, abstain from these things. And they write this down in letter form and they decide because of the discernment in the church to send this letter back. And here's what the Bible says uh, in this letter. It says, then the uh, apostles and elders with the whole church selected men. This is in verse 22. They selected men who were among them and and they sent them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Now, they could have just sent Paul and Barnabas. And, and I thought, you know, that would have been okay. Give them a letter, send them back, read it. But boy, it means something when you go there. It's sort of like when we went to Casper, uh, Wyoming. Jake made the statement last Sunday night that I really appreciated. He said, it was almost like everything was frantic. And then when, when Chris saw us and, and Chris saw me, and he just kind of breathed a, you know, a breath of relief. Somebody's here today. And, you know, the guys that went to Casper, Wyoming, they'll never, they'll never hear Wind City Church the same way as you. They'll never hear the words Chris Sims in the same way because they've met the guy. They, they know what he's struggling with. They know some of the issues that, that he would face. And so they decided to send some men. So they sent Paul and Barnabas to go back, and then Judas uh, called Bar, uh, Bar Sabbas and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. And they wrote this letter to be delivered to them. Now listen, the letter begins in verse 23. It says, from the apostles and the elders, your brothers. That's important. That's important. They just affirmed their salvation. They just affirmed their church, your brothers. To the brothers among the Gentiles, in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. Because we have heard that some, without our authorization, went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your heart. We have unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly loved Barnabas and Paul who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas who will personally support the same thing by word of mouth for it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours to put no greater burden on you than these necessary things that you abstain from food offered to idols from blood, uh, from eating anything that has been strangled from sexual uh, immorality, you will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. The church discerned truth. There's nothing wrong with disagreements in the church. It happens. We're, we're human. I mean, you're not always going to see things the same way I see things. I'm not always going to see things the same way you see things. There's nothing wrong with someone saying, you know, I've got a problem with that. Uh, my, the first church that I was a part of, the associate pastor there and the youth minister, and it, we had a guy, he's, he's gone on to be with the Lord now, his first name was Cecil. Every once in a while in a business meeting, Cecil would vote no. I mean, on something, and it would be something so minor that the whole church was voting yes on. I never saw him do it on a grant a letter or anything like that, but every once in a while, he just, no. And everybody would look at him, and he would look at everybody, and he'd say, well, every once in a while, somebody ought to vote no around here. <laughs> he didn't really have a reason. He just wanted to vote no. Listen, a, a, a little bit of no is okay. It's okay. Keep us honest. Keep us thinking. And I'm sure we're doing the right thing, you know. A little discussion in business is okay. Notice our emphasis on little, right? We'll be here all night, but a little discussion. Thank goodness it's not business meeting. But at the end of the day, we've got to let the Holy Spirit work. And we've got to come to an agreement of some kind. And we're going to see in a few moments what happens when you can't come to an agreement. You split. And that's the greatest fear that I have as a pastor. That I would pastor a church that splits. And it doesn't matter what the splits are. Doing. The last thing I ever want to see a church do is split. The worst heartache I've ever heard a pastor speak of is when the members of the church split. 
after all, we just we have to guard against it. Because as great as I believe our church is, and I do believe it to be, as loving as I believe we all are, it would be very easy for us to split. You know why? Because I've seen churches that I thought that they'd never split. They did. And people are hurt. And problems arise. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart. Do you know that everything that we've done in the last three years, I've not agreed with everything we've done. Did you know that? Not everything. There have been a few things that I thought, well, that might stop. But the church voted to do it, so we did it. Now, y'all, it's okay to say that out loud. And there's probably a few things that we've done that, that you didn't agree with, but you, you know, the church voted to do it, so you did it. Now, I pray it's not when they called me to be your pastor. <laughs> It's going to happen. Look, look, things are going to happen. I mean, somebody's going to vote for the carpet to be brown, and you, you really wanted another color. But, but brown's okay. And you can move on. Now listen, there are some things that are not debatable. And God's word is true, and we believe that. We're not going to debate that. We're not going to debate salvation by grace. We're not going to have the conversation they've had here in Jerusalem and Antioch. We're not going to have that conversation in this church. Because it is what it is. We know the truth. It will not be debated. There's no way for a human being to fall from grace once they know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That is one verse that's taken way out of context. And it's only one verse. But there's some things that are not debatable in this church. Don't get me wrong. But there are a lot of things that are. Length of sermon. We'll debate that till Jesus comes back. <laughs> Whether the pastor should yell or be quiet. We'll debate those things. What version of the Bible, that, that's, that's a debate. If things like that can be debated, but we're not going to debate the truth of God's word. But listen, if we have a disagreement, let it be a disagreement. Just let it be a disagreement. And there are times we have to be agreeable to disagree. There are. And everybody look up here and don't miss it. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to go to a church where you agree with everything that takes place in that church. You don't. Because if you're looking for that church, you're looking for a perfect church. And they don't exist. And if they did and you joined it, you'd run. Because <laughs> you're sinners. And so they have this big dispute. They write this letter back and they said, look, the Holy Spirit moved and we agree. <laughs> That's a good thing to do, by the way. When the Holy Spirit says it, you better believe it because it's God. And when God speaks, God's people should listen and respond accordingly with a yes, sir. Amen. Amen. And so they write this letter back and they said, the Holy Spirit spoke. We agreed. We discerned that this was the truth. And we decided to send these brothers back to you to affirm your existence as a church. And just keep on keeping on. But don't forget to abstain from a few things. Other than that, keep on keeping on. The Bible says in verse 30, then being sent off, they went down to Antioch and after gathering uh, the assembly, they delivered the letter. And when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Now don't you know to a young church full of Gentiles, they get this letter from Jerusalem to Antioch, they get this letter that was signed by the half-brother of Jesus who is the leader of the church of that day, and it also had Peter's signature on it as well. To get that letter of affirmation from the church, from the hub, from the center of, of the church of the day, to get that letter from the, keep on keeping on. You're our brothers in Christ. What an encouragement that must have been to get that letter. And so when they read it, they rejoiced of its encouragement. Verse 32, it says, but, but Judas and Silas, who were also prophets themselves, preachers themselves, encouraged the brothers and strengthened them with a long message. Don't you like that? <laughs> well, it looks good. Right? That thing, but a long message. After spending some time there, and I'm just going to let that go. All right? I could spend a long time on that, but I won't. <laughs> Fun intended. All right, verse 33. After spending some time there, they sent back a peace, excuse me, sent back in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas, along with many others, remained in Antioch, teaching and proclaiming 
the message of the Lord. They went on their merry way. And then after some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, you know what, let's go back and visit the brothers in every town where we have preached the message of the Lord. And let's just see how they're doing. And that's what he said in verse 36. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul did not think it appropriate to take along this man who had deserted him in captivity and had not gone on with them to the work. There was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended to the grace of the Lord by the brothers who traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the church. You got a disagreement in Jerusalem and Antioch, Paul and Barnabas go and and they preach and they teach on behalf of the truth of God's word. In verse 12 of Acts 15, the Bible says, the whole assembly fell silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describing all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Doctrinally, these two guys agreed. But personally, they couldn't come to an agreement. Now, literally, we're just talking a few days later. We're not talking three or four years later. We're talking just a few days, maybe a month, maybe a month and a half, but not, not long down the road. They disagree because one guy wanted to take his family and Paul says, he ain't going. I'm not going to have him because he's a coward. He's a deserter. He left us when we were on our first missionary trip and you think I'm going to take him again? I'm not taking that. Whatever. You fill in the blank. And Barnabas said, well, if he ain't going, I ain't going. Because he's family. Blood's thicker than water, and you just forget it. I'm not going to go. And they fought, and they argued. And the Bible says there was such a sharp disagreement. It's not just a disagreement, but it's sharp, and it's cut, and it's hateful, and it's mean, and it's arrogant, and it's full of pride. One sails that way, and one sails that way. And all into the sunset they go. Listen. This is not Doug. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the guy who wrote three quarters of our New Testament. Aren't you glad it was written by sinners just like us? You ever had a disagreement? I said, have you ever had a disagreement? Have you ever, have you ever had a disagreement to the, I mean, to, to such a, I mean, so sharp that you just had to split company? Just old. I heard a story about a farmer who had a complaining wife. Now, ladies, this is just a joke. <laughs> Up front, this is just a joke. He had a complaining wife. She nagged on him all the time, just complained about everything. Everything. And he would go out to the barn, and there he'd have this donkey, and this donkey was just quiet and calm, did everything he asked the donkey to do. And one day, he asked his wife to come out with him uh, to help him feed the donkey. Walks out there and she just starts complaining and nagging about everything. And, you know, this stupid donkey. I have to feed this donkey. And about that time, the donkey was rears back to her right in her face and killed her graveyard pig right there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and so they have their funeral service. And the pastor gets up and preaches the service, you know. And, but before he gets up to preach, he notices, as we do, they have visitation. And Men and women were coming down to visit this guy who's lost his wife. And he noticed that every time the women would come by, the man would shake his head in, in total agreement, seemingly. And then the, the, the men would come by, and in disgust, he would look, and he would shake his head no. And so the pastor said, I've got to ask him about that after the service. And so they did the service, and then the graveside, and they did what good Baptists do. They were having a meal, you know, after feeding the family. And so the pastor, after everybody kind of leaves, and the men goes out, the pastor goes over to the guy and said, I've got to know. You know, I, I noticed during the service that uh, right before the service that the, the ladies would come by and you would nod yes in, in total agreement with everything they said, but the men would come by and you would just, you know, have this frowned up look on your face and would say no. What, what's the deal? It didn't just happen once or twice, it happened every time. And the farmer said, well, said, the ladies would come by and the ladies would say, uh, you know, your wife was such a good cook, she was so kind, she was so beautiful, and he, you know, just saying something kind about my wife, and he said, of course, I agree with that. And the 
he said, every man that come by wanted to know if my donkey was for sale, and I told him, oh, no. <laughs> you know, I was thinking after this morning, we need a good laugh. so sharp and so stern and disagreeing that they said, that's it, we're done. This Barnabas, Mr. Encouragement, and the Apostle Paul, who most people say is the greatest Christian ever walked the face of the planet other than Jesus Christ himself, and they were so angry that it, I mean, close to fighting. I mean, they, they walked away. Who was right? Well, if you would have asked Paul at that time, Paul would have said, well, I'm right. I'm right. He left us. He deserted us. If you would have asked Barnabas, Barnabas would have said, well, he's not right. I'm right. How dare him talk about my family like that? And they argued and they fight and they fall. And then they split. Now, later on, the good news is Paul understands he was wrong. Because he, he asked that John Mark come back. It, it's sort of a, an act of... Sorry. And, and later on, he and Barnabas do get back together. They do settle their dispute, and, and that's a good thing. But Y'all, I saw two guys almost fist fight over a knife maker one time. In a big I saw it. With my own two eyes, I saw it over an ice maker. One wanted one this big, and the other wanted one this big. And we got the one this big. We needed one this big. That's beside the point. They, they almost fist fall. I mean, one got up and said, if you meet me outside, we'll settle this issue of the ice maker. And he walked out. And I got up, and I thought, well, I need to go try to calm him down. So I walked out. Hey, three deacons followed me out, the associate pastor of that church. They said, we thought you were going to hit him. I was trying to calm him down. I don't want to fight over an ice maker. You goofy. Over an ice maker. I, I could tell you story after story after story of things that I've personally seen in Baptist churches of the fights and the arguments and the disputes and this person on this side of the sanctuary is not speaking to this person on this. I won't speak to them if Jesus doesn't come back for 200 years and allows me to live every day till he comes. I've heard statements between brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> but I don't hear those kind of statements in this church. I don't. Matter of fact, I've never heard a statement like that in this church. I don't mean we don't all get along all the time. You know, we're not that perfect. But at the end of the day, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And I don't know about you, but I sound like a piece of crap. I want to look more like the church and the council when they got together and said, you know what, that's right, we're wrong. And I don't want to look anywhere close to like Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. The deal today was good, y'all. That was very good. It'll be in the book. I thank you. That makes it official. It's in the book. <laughs> Y'all, in years, I can't express how thankful I am to be a pastor of this church. You don't know it, but I've been, I've been in some tough places. When they were going to ordain me into the ministry, there was a man uh, in the room who said, God never called that boy to preach, and I'm against it, and I'm going to fight it. day of my ordination when it was two there they came with full intention to stop the ordination and they did a pretty good job you don't know how thankful I am to be a part of a church that we've been on about eight mission trips in three years every time I think you know financially I don't know if we can we can stand anymore and you vote to help someone else last Sunday night 
bringing up the idea. And by the way, things have changed a little bit. I talked to Moses this last week. Things have changed a little bit. We, we're not going to cut the whole check right now. He, he, he doesn't want that. He wants to see something coming from our church to his church. He said his church needs to see that and, and know that there's help and love and support. And he said that's just a good way to do that. He said, so please don't write the whole check for that container that we voted in to do last night. So we're going to back off a little bit on that. You're okay with not paying as much as we voted to pay, right? <laughs> One time I went to buy two guns, and the guy said, they're $75 a piece, but I'll let you have them both for $150. And I bought them and thought I got a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> I was halfway home and went, shit. <laughs> Saw me coming. I'll just make sure everybody understands. Less, not more. But y'all, things like that, every once in a while, you know, I just get nervous before business. I don't know. Because I've been there. I've been in tough places, and I know what it's like. I know it could be that way here, but it's not. And I walk out of a meeting like that, you know, me and Gary sometimes we talk, we did this last week, but we had talked, and said, you know, we voted through a lot of stuff. And it was just, you know, let's go, let's do this. Let's do what God's called us to do. I'm thankful for that. Amen. And by the way, I don't take it for granted. <coughs> I don't. I'm thankful that we have members who go out of town and tell me they can't wait to get back to their church. Amen. The church that they go to out of town, nothing like the church they go to. I'm thankful for that. And I just as soon keep it that way. Now listen, the only way to keep it that way is to stay on our knees, Barbara. Mm -hmm. We need to be on our knees in our country. Don't hear me wrong. And you heard that this morning. But, but as well as for our country, we need to be on our knees for our church. <coughs> See, God's blessing our church. I don't know how many new folks we had this morning. We had a lot of visitors this morning. And the majority of them stayed to eat, which is a good sign for my church. And I, I'm thankful for that, but I don't want it to stop. When you let us get into a bickering contest among one another, God will shut the windows of heaven over this church. Because I've seen it. One of the churches that I used to pastor was either growing and baptizing people every week. Right now, tonight, <coughs> they, they average 11 at the same time. Because of fighting and arguing. I'm not saying we're there. We're, we're far from there now. It would be easy. And as we talk about buildings and all these things, we, we can get there so quick. Let's guard against it. Let's guard against it. And listen, let's let the Holy Spirit work. And when he speaks, let's follow the two words. Yes, sir. Let's our heads and close our eyes. We're going to have a time of invitation. You know, after a sermon like this, it's not necessarily a salvation message. It's, you, you just, you kind of wonder what the invitation may look like. And I don't know what God's speaking to your heart. But if he's speaking to your heart, if any issue, you, maybe you have a dispute that I don't know about, nobody else knows about but you and the other person. Maybe they're here this morning. And you need to just walk across the aisle or maybe across the church and just say, I would love to. I'm sorry. Or maybe you have part of this country with someone here, but I had, maybe it was 40 years ago and I had no clue about that issue, but you know it. God just brought it to your attention. Maybe you need to do business with God and bring that person. Maybe that person's not here. And you need to make a phone call email or something to let them know, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe you can sit down and write a letter. I, I don't know what God would do. But if he spoke to your heart, I just pray that you'd answer and obey him with a yes. Whatever it is. Whatever he asks you to do. Yes. Now listen, if you're here tonight and you don't know Christ, your Lord and Savior, and you're working real hard to get to heaven, you need to stop. You need to get on your knees before a holy God and say, God, forgive me. I trust you. I place my faith in your grace. And if I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to go to heaven by the blood of the gift of the Son of Jesus Christ. Because listen, there's no other way to go. I don't know what you need to do tonight, but if God spoke to your heart, I pray you'd answer that. And say, yes, Lord. Father, Lord, invitation to you. Use it as you see fit in a way that only you can use it. And Father, I pray that after we're done here tonight, as we say, we were 
in the presence of God this morning, be it in this presence or not. Lord, use the message of your word and your truth for your honor and your glory at this moment. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll sing. You need to come. <coughs> Texas and a few other places, Virginia and the other. They talked about several places. Um, we have some places in the state of Arkansas that they would love to attack. So, you know, we're, we're right in the heart of, of all of it. we got some really good friends that live in, in New York City. And, uh, and they sent us a message last week said, just pray for this coming west. Uh, they were right down the road from, from one of the bombings not too long ago. And so, you know, it's just a scary time. facing this week. This is a big week for our nation. Big week for our nation. So you pray um, this week. You know, it's funny. I was on the way home after church this morning, and I heard uh, Frankie Gray on the radio. They were airing his, his statements about the election, you know, showing Terry Holmes, saying he's going to vote. And, uh, you know, he was just in, 
encourage you to do is teach the great book. You know, and I'm like, amen. And God heard the sermon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, this uh, men's prayer breakfast Tuesday morning. Of course, the ladies have Bible study uh, Tuesday morning. Men as well downstairs uh, at 9 o'clock. So we're going to cover it tomorrow night, 545. A lot of things going on uh, this week. Guys, try to come uh, this Tuesday morning. If you've been coming to the prayer breakfast, if you haven't been coming, you can start. It's 6 o'clock. I love getting up that early and going down. But uh, we usually have 20, 25 men gathered around. We have time of prayer. We're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for what's going to happen that day. We're going to talk about our Bible study. We're going to be doing called the Man Cave. Uh, if you remember Dan Schlumberg that came um, a few months ago to our church, he's written that book, the Man Cave. So we're going to begin to walk through that chapter by chapter. And we'll start with chapter one uh, this Tuesday. So, anyway, all that's happening this week. So be in prayer for everything that happens. Anything else needs to be said or announced before we leave? If not, Brother Roger, will you pray us out? Let's pray. Dear Father, we do thank you for your message tonight as we walk through Acts. Father, how we want to draw our relationship one with another. Father, how we want to be in the body of Christ. Father, yes, we can have disagreements. Father, the great debate is whether we agree with the Holy Spirit. Be with us as we go with us.